Hey, it's Avier from the Exocet Browser Dev Team, and this is Crash Bandicoot for PlayStation running in VR. Uh, this is the old school PlayStation, not PlayStation 4, and this is all running in JavaScript, WebAssembly, and WebXR. Uh, so I just wanted to walk you guys through how we kind of like took a 2D console like the PlayStation and managed to make it work in immersive VR. Uh, you can kind of like walk around and see that everything here is completely 3D. Um, so I guess a uh, history lesson first. Uh, the PlayStation was very much a 2D machine. Um, even if it looks 3D, um, the entire architecture kind of straddled the world between um, things like the Super Nintendo and the Xbox. And it came out at a time when people like really didn't know the right way to do 3D graphics. So the architecture of the PlayStation is that as a 2D GPU, um, completely 2D, like the only thing that you can do is you can draw polygons and triangles and you do get things like texturing and garage shading and and pretty much every regular modern graphics technique, but you could only do it in 2D. Uh, so then you might wonder like, so how did the PlayStation do anything that seemed 3D? And the answer is that it had a coprocessor uh, called the GTE or Geometry Transform Engine. And that could be used to fill the role of what in modern terms we would think of as the vertex shader, which is basically taking uh, a geometry mesh, uh, putting it through matrices, doing that math. Um, so the way that a PlayStation uh, rendering pipeline would work is that you'd load up models from the CD or something, um, and then you throw it through the GTE, the Geometry Transform Engine, to do like your matrix transforms, and then you would get 2D points out of that. And then those 2D points is what you would use to draw actual graphics. Um, but as you can imagine, like there would be a lot of really weird problems uh, associated with that such as maybe you'd have precision errors or it would be really hard to program and all of that is true. And I guess you see a bit of that here. Uh, I guess the PlayStation is really notorious for um, its weird texture issues and that all comes down to this architecture. And it's also why this was really hard to do to get all this working in VR. Um, but thankfully, it's not so bad if you're doing things in JavaScript and WebAssembly. So this is Metal Gear Solid for the PlayStation, also running in VR. And this was one of the most graphically advanced titles um, for that console, which you can see evidence of through this extreme texture warbling uh, in the geometry um, and people's faces being hideously deformed as we walk through this sub. So this actually gives us an opportunity to really go deeper into how the geometry system of the PlayStation worked and how we got this working in VR. So the way that you would load up a model in the PSX would be, you would take the geometry data from the CD and you would take your camera matrix and throw all of that through something called the geometry transform engine, which really just did matrix math. And out of that, you would get 2D points, which you could draw to the GPU. And those 2D points would go on to a 1024 by 512 frame buffer. Um, but once you got your data out of the GTE, that's it. It's no longer 3D. 
So smarter people than me have already solved this problem in the emulation community because the PlayStation has long been known for like having really weird texture issues and having not even correct uh, perspective mapping. So people writing PlayStation emulators have already solved this with a hack called PGXP or the Parallel Precision Transform Pipeline. Ooh, this looks really nice. <laughs> you really feel like you're inside on this underwater scene. Anyway, uh, so people have already solved this in the emulator community. And we are just reusing that work in order to make things work in VR. And the way that the PGXP hack works is that you have an extra Z cache inside your frame buffer, which connects the original vertices, uh, the 3D vertices, to the 2D points that they result in using just this weird linkage, um, just basically hacking an extra cache between the GTE and the GPU. And so if you manage to get things more or less correct, then that allows you to reverse the transform between 3D to 2D and back again. And so when you're putting your data into your GPU, you can get 3D points back. Uh, and it mostly works. Once you have something like that, then you can just do a double eye render, uh, intercept your GL calls and just draw twice for VR but you still have a little bit of the warbling. And the reason for that is essentially that um, the PGXP hack isn't 100% accurate because uh, it's totally possible for when you're doing a 2D render for one single point to be composed of multiple vertices at the source. And so that's why sometimes this hack gets confused and you can see that like one of the 2D points is taking Z data from some further point backwards and it's not 100% accurate, but it still works relatively well. And I mean, this gets us to playability for Metal Gear Solid in VR. So actually with ExoKit, um, one of the things that we wanted to experiment with is taking this scene and applying some sort of slam technique to it. Um, slam being simultaneous localization and mapping. It's what's used in things like Magic Leap and uh, self-driving cars, for example. And what slam does is it's a way of taking in a data feed from something like a scene and localizing points and tracking anchors inside the world. For example, getting a point cloud or a triangle mesh or something of that nature out of a whole bunch of frames. And if we had something like that, then we could use it, for example, to correct a lot of the perspective weird warbling issues that the PlayStation experiences. Uh, so I can show you an example of that right here. Let's go down. So you can see how these stairs, as I'm walking around, they kind of warble backwards and forwards. And that's just because the buffer for the frames, the frame buffer, has a very low Z resolution. Um, it's really only 1024 by 512. So even though we are in VR and we have full Vive resolution in all the triangles, super high res, the actual Z resolution is not that high. Um, because it's just PlayStation. Um, it's just the way the hardware works. But we have the opportunity with like putting in some sort of layer here in the JavaScript. Uh, we could do SLAM or some sort of machine learning model where we can track the points between each frame and make sure that we cache the correct Z for every single piece of geometry, which would essentially mean we are ray casting into VR to build a scene out of the existing much worse scene that's coming out of the PlayStation hardware. I just thought that that would be kind of like an interesting thing to do, applying AR techniques to VR in order to make the old games work much better in a new world.
All right, so we're going to move on to the next game. Okay, so here we have Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. And you can see from this angle, things look almost correct, at least in the left eye. But if we move away from that perspective, we can see how much of a lie this game really is in VR. It turns out that Tony Hawk, or the player character, is actually drawn ahead of the geometry, and he's simply being clipped away, um, or the death test is being disabled while he's drawn. And the geometry itself is this weird frustum nightmare <laughs> that's happening in front of the camera. You can even see his shadow right there on top of the geometry. Um, this is all completely fake. <laughs> Um, so, which is why I put up on the right-hand side of the screen the code that we can use to debug this kind of stuff. Um, since it's just JavaScript um, and a very light C++ binding, uh, you can intercept the calls for things like GL Uniform 4FB, which gives us an entry point for changing the matrix for this projection, as well as uh, GL Draw Arrays, which actually draws geometries. You can see the PlayStation also operates on quads sometimes instead of triangles, which is why a lot of this geometry is not actual trigs. It's four-sided um, polygons going through the 2D GPU that's infamous for its craziness. And I just thought it'd be fun to show you guys some of this stuff that we deal with and how we deal with it in making MUKit and ExoKit. Hey, so we are back inside the Nintendo 64 running Perfect Dark in VR. Uh, we really lucked out with the projection and model view matrix. Uh, this is the same one that we were running from Ocarina of Time, but it just, it's basically human sized. As you can see, I can kind of like walk up to this laptop and start typing and examine these keys. They seem completely crazy and <laughs> what is that? Some sort of mouse or trackpad? Kind of cool. Uh, also, what we have here is the 2D plane that contains all of the lights and the skybox. This is how developers did things, I guess, back in the day. The lights were not part of the 3D scene, but they're just this overlay that you're supposed to view from this angle. It's kind of cool. Another thing about this game is that the pause menu is this weird AR diddly doodle. That's oh, ginormous. But I guess this was the vision people had for AR or Google Glass back in 1998 or whenever this game came out. So now we're running that vision of AR inside actual VR and actual AR, which I thought was kind of ironic. Uh, when people first saw this running, uh, the first question they had was, can I run this in Unity or my favorite engine? Uh, because ideally, with games like this, you want to be able to use your controllers, use the inputs from some other engine uh, to actually be able to shoot and point at the world and have it actually be immersive. Uh, so the answer is yes, we can totally do that. Um, since this is just running inside the ExoKit browser, uh, it's just a node module. So if you want to do native bindings, then you can. And if you want to use JS bindings, then you can. Uh, that's actually what we're using for overlaying this controller stuff on top of the world. This is just a 3JS layer that's overlaid on top of the scene after the Nintendo 64 emulator does its thing. So yeah, uh, should also work with pretty much every single AR or VR device uh, that includes the Vive, which is what we're using, the Oculus, the Magic Leap, and the Leap Motion. That's another interesting thing we'd like to be able to plug in is to have like actual Leap Motion hands. Uh, the data is already coming through. It's just we would need to do some kind of rendering and potentially do a bit of ROM hacking to hook in an actual controllable gun. I always wanted to be able to do that with this game. Uh, this game was actually really ahead of its time, I feel like. Um, 
because it had co-op, it had counter-op, and it had a four-player split screen with like four or six other, or even I think eight other computer-controlled opponents. It was really nuts. Uh, this is all running on the Nintendo 64 original hardware. Uh, the frame rate, frame rate was uh, pretty bad back in the day, but as you can see, we do a bit of reprojection to cover up for the fact that the emulator is slow. So there's actually no lag inside the, the headset. Uh, the only lag that's coming through is from the CPU that the Nintendo 64 is crunching. But it should totally be doable to hook this into some other engine and use WebSockets or UDP or WebRTC even and do some sort of multiplayer thing in, for example, the combat simulator. Uh, that's another interesting thing about this game is that uh, the combat simulator uh, was, I guess, the vision of virtual reality <laughs> where like, you're this agent that's working for this really high-tech company which trains its agents uh, through VR simulations of combat. <laughs> and I guess we're doing that in real life now. Uh, so I actually wanted to show you guys that bit of the combat simulator, because that also works. If I can figure out how to control this menu. Uh, decline. Do not start another mission. This should bring us back. Uh, one thing that I guess we could also do is to hack some of these overlays to be more face locked or maybe just like at least track the head so that when you're going into a menu, you don't have to kneel over and look at things. Combat simulator challenge. Let's do the first one. Start. This was probably my favorite part of the game. Um, just playing this stuff in for player, multiplayer, and shooting each other. So yeah, uh, actually RetroArch has pretty decent support uh, for doing netplay, uh, which is just basically transferring controller data uh, across the network. And since this is all just compiled to JavaScript, uh, you could hook up a WebSocket to pipe that data through. And then you have your four player combat in Perfect Dark. Okay, so we are back and this is Star Fox 64 VR. Um, we almost forgot about this game actually until somebody mentioned it on Twitch, but it's, um. It's pretty much a perfect showcase for what we're trying to do with ExoKit and MUKit. Because it's one of those um, pick up and play arcade type games that works on a lot of different devices. And you could totally imagine how this would work where you're just sitting on your couch and annoying frogs are talking to you in front of you instead of like you watching TV, you're watching the scene as a hologram uh, just playing out there in your living room. Uh, and th this is also one of those games that, since it's like very pick up and play, it works with all sorts of control schemes. Like right now we're in the Vive, but you can totally imagine how if you go inside the cockpit here, you could have like some virtual joystick and you could use your hands to actually be Fox for the first time and control the R-Wing and do a barrel roll. That's kind of disorienting, but... It works, it's kind of cool. So another thing that uh, we were talking about with games like this is that something like this could be very embeddable. Since this is all just a website that we're looking at here, it's just HTML and JavaScript and WebAssembly and WebXR. It's just a regular site that you can boot in the ExoKit browser. So that means you could theoretically make it into a component of like an entity component system. Uh, such as A-Frame or Janus or what have you, or maybe even Unity once we figured out that integration. It could just be something that you embed inside of another scene or perhaps inside of another app. Like let's say you had uh, like a VR arcade type thing or an AR arcade 
And you can imagine that you have a whole bunch of cabinets, or maybe the cabinets are portals that you open up into the actual world of the game. And so you could have like a portal to Star Fox VR or Star Fox AR. And maybe you could even have like a whole bunch of cartridges on the wall, like make it really old school. Except the cartridges are like VR cartridges, so that like when you pick up the cartridge, you can like expand it and like walk inside of it, and then you have a scene like this. I think that could really work. I mean, there's a whole bunch of possibilities that you could unlock once you have something like this running in a hackable environment like JavaScript or a website. Uh, since we've done it, uh, I guess the next step is to figure out what to do with it. And the answer is I don't know because there's so much that we could do. Um, the main source of ideas for us is just people watching the Twitch streams and like telling us, hey, you forgot about Star Fox. Let's try that. And it turned out it just worked. So yeah, if you enjoy the kind of stuff that we're doing here with emulation and just like mixed realityfying things, uh, join us on the Twitch streams, join us on the Discord. Um, we do this stuff for fun. And it's all open source. You can actually download and play with uh, both ExoKit and MUKit. Uh, works on a lot of things. Right now I'm using the Vive, but we're trying to get pretty much all of the devices supported since the whole thing is just a node module. I mean, it's just a matter of plugging in the APIs. So yeah, I'm gonna try to not kill Peppy here, but uh, I think we're gonna leave it here. Um, maybe I'll take a few swings at this boss, but I am Avier Kazmer and I am on the ExoKit browser dev team, and this has been EmuKit, the emulator framework that runs on top of it. Uh, thankfully, we didn't have to do too much development on it um, because smarter people than I have created RetroArch, which is the core of the emulator frameworks that we're using. Um, but we VRified it, and I, don't, I think it's pretty cool. So yeah, links in the description if you want to check out the code or if you want to join the streams or the Discord and tell us what you want us to do next. And I'll catch you in the next video or on the stream, whenever. Yay. Goodbye, Andros Henchman. I guess we can call that mission complete. Okay, so as an addendum, I wanted to show how to get this working on your machine. Um, so to get the ExoKit browser, you just go to get.webmr.io, and that should automatically start the download for your operating system. You just go ahead, open that, and install it. Uh, but I already have it here. You just go to ExoKit command prompt, and in here, you can type a URL. And in our case, that URL is going to be mukit.webmr.io. So we just go over there, paste it in, press enter. And that should load up mukit inside of exokit. Uh, once you're here, all you have to do is you drag in the ROM file that you want to run. Uh, in this case, I'm going to run Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time for Nintendo 64. Just drop that in there. And that should start the game. And then once you're in, all you got to do to enter VR is you just click. And if we are lucky, it works. Yay. Uh, if you have any problems with that, um, just come say hi on Discord and we'll be glad to help you out.